Hello, Jeff Zwerink, and welcome again to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific discoveries and how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined again by Dr. Fuzz Rana, and we're going to talk about the latest results from the ENCODE project. Fuzz, it's good to have you here again today. Thanks for having me, Jeff. How are you? Doing well. So the ENCODE project, something that's been going around, going on for roughly a decade, uh, why don't you tell us, just kind of give us a little bit of background. What does ENCODE stand for? What is it trying to do? Uh, what, what's kind of the science behind it? Yeah, well, the way I like to think about the ENCODE project is that it is essentially kind of like the Rosetta Stone for the Human Genome Project, uh, where the idea would be that in 2000, when the first draft was produced of the human genome, you have this massive amount of sequence data you know, 3.2 billion genetic letters in the human genome, but nobody knows how to read that. Mm. And, and so the ENCODE project was launched shortly afterwards as a, as a, a pilot study to see if we could identify uh, the functional elements uh, in the human genome and, and, and understand what those elements meant to, uh, to us with respect to biological function. And so uh, in 2007 and then 2012, phase one and phase two results were published respectively. And to everybody's surprise, they basically showed us that uh, a significant proportion of the human genome uh, pushing 80% plus actually was functional, consisted of functional elements, which was shocking because everybody expected it to be well under 10%. And, and so uh, the ENCODE project since that point in time has generated enormous amount of controversy uh, uh, for a number of reasons, but it's really a, a, a very exciting project because it's giving us some really fundamental understanding about the human genome and how the human genome uh, operates. So, so that, that's kind of an interesting description. So when you, you've got the, the mapping of the human genome, which was done, you say, in the early 2000s, or at least the bulk of it, uh, uh, and then, so ENCODE is kind of going in saying, okay, we know all this stuff is in there. Now we're asking the question, what does it do? What parts are functional? What parts right. are desolate, if you will? So it's kind of like having the, you know, your atlas of the, the United States and now going in and kind of looking at each of the different regions and saying, what does it look like? And how does this contribute to the country, if you will? Yeah, that's, that's a great way to, to put it. Yes. And so, you know, your, your comment about uh, the amount of functionality in the genome is interesting because I remember, uh, and I'm sure you will as well, you know, there was this uh, discussion for the long time about how many um, genes there were in the genome. And I remember these discussions of saying, you know, there's got to be this many in order to account for all the diversity of humanity. And then it, it actually came out to be a relatively small number, which to me is indicative of a lot, or a fairly complicated system, if you will. So. Uh, to me, I guess it's not all that surprising that we find a lot of complexity or a lot of functionality, but how did, how did that play out? What are, what are the things that they found that says, ah, oh, this is function, and what does that mean from a creation-evolution perspective? Yeah, well, I mean, there was, a, you know, I think six different tests that they were using for functionality, and uh, collectively, with, the, with, with respect to those six tests, it turns out that about 80% of the human genome displays some kind of biochemical activity. Uh, and many people would equate the biochemical activity to actual function. But one of the debates that was going on immediately was, could that function, or sorry, could that activity actually be biochemical noise or was it bona fide function? And that was a debate that raged and continues to rage actually today. But it turns out that there's a number of other independent studies done by people that are not connected with the ENCODE project that have demonstrated that many of those functional attributes uh, identified by the ENCODE project are actually bona fide functions. Uh, so there's, there's a number of independent studies that are affirming the results of the, of the ENCODE project. So I feel more confident today that that result of the ENCODE project first reported in 2012 is actually a valid result. So, so the significant finding was that, you know, this 80% or, or, and I think you, in other places you mentioned, possibly it's going to be more than that, has some sort of chemical or biological activity, which then there's this connection with biological or function, which is important because, you know, you got this concept of junk DNA out there where there's this stuff just littered through our genome that's junk and doesn't do anything. 
if I get you right, this biological activity, if that's function, that means the junk DNA has function as well, correct? That, that's exactly right. I mean, many of the, the so-called you know, functional regions in the human genome are actually what we would have uh, attributed at, to junk DNA prior to the results of the ENCODE project. Hmm. And it turns out that a lot of uh, that, that so-called junk DNA is actually functioning in a regulatory role uh, you know, turning on and turning off genes at the right time. And it's really that combination of turning on genes, turning them off. And then once a gene is turned on, regulating how active that gene is, uh, that really allows for the biological diversity that we see in human beings. So even though you've got about 20,000 genes in the human genome, uh, the, the way that you're using those genes mm -hmm. is really what contributes to, um, to biological diversity. And it's all through the, the so-called junk DNA that's, again, functioning as this very elaborate system of on-off switches and then volume control knobs, in effect, that is uh, really uh, responsible for our biology. So that is actually very fascinating. So this idea that there are a relatively small number of genes makes sense in light of this regulatory function mm -hmm. that the quote-unquote junk DNA was playing. So you can have a small number of genes, they're just manipulated by the junk, quote unquote, junk DNA in order of when to turn on. So it really kind of belies the idea that it's actually junk, it would seem. Yes, yes. And, uh, and of course, you know, people that hold to the evolutionary paradigm are really are uncomfortable with the results of the ENCODE project. And I've, I've heard a number of evolutionary biologists say in a number of contexts that if the results of the ENCODE project are correct, then it means that fundamental ideas that are part of the evolutionary paradigm simply cannot be valid. Uh, and, and so they, on the, that basis, they actually uh, are, raise fundamental questions about the, the validity of the ENCODE project results. And to me, that always feels a bit like a bizarro world approach to science, where suddenly you've got you know, the, the theory in it being a value, used to evaluate the data versus the data being used to evaluate the theory. Uh, but this is showing you how deeply committed people are to the evolutionary framework and, and how troubling the ENCODE project results actually are for somebody that would view life's history in evolutionary terms. If you could just kind of take the last 30 seconds here or so to what, what are, what's going on, what are the latest things that come out of the ENCODE project? Kind of bring us up to date. Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's uh, the, the latest results really are uh, centered around uh, what do we mean by function, where I think there's a growing uh, collection of data that indicates that the way the ENCODE project defined function is actually legitimate. Uh, there's a debate going on about what is the actual percentage of the human genome that could truly be functional. Uh, and uh, again, the results that are coming out of that indicate that the original results of the ENCODE project seems to be valid. So, uh, you know, the, the ENCODE project is still generating data. They're in actually phase four. Uh, but what to me is most significant is the fact that there are, again, people outside the ENCODE project that are doing work that continues to affirm the original results uh, published from phase two in 2012. Uh, so it really is that the, the case for design in the genome is becoming stronger. Well, again, I thank you very much for your comments, Fuzz. It was a very fascinating discussion today. You know, I, I remember first hearing about the ENCODE project and just being fascinated of how this extensive advancement of science, advancement of our understanding of the human genome, how it not only undermines an evolutionary scenario, it actually points to a creation type scenario. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Fuzz's writings on this. One particular article you can look for is, do scientists accept the results of the ENCODE project? It will help you understand this fascinating discovery, great area of research, and help you to be better equipped to spread the gospel.